On the day of my husband's birthday party, my son's family and I were spending time together with him. Our grandson Michael gave a piece of rolled up drawing paper as a gift. Grandpa, happy birthday. He exclaimed. My husband received, replying. Thank you. My husband loves Michael. We always frame and display the drawings Michael gives us. I was excited to see my husband's reaction to Michael's gift on this special day. With a tender smile, my husband carefully began to unwrap it. However, as soon as he saw the drawing, he crumpled it and threw it aside. Shocked, I quickly picked it up and unfolded the wrinkled drawing, revealing a portrait of my husband. What are you doing? Apologize to him. I exclaimed, frustrated by his reaction. Despite the effort Michael put into the drawing, my husband seemed angry. Don't you notice? He said quietly, then lifted the hem of Michael's shirt, revealing something underneath. My name is Nancy. I'm a 55-year-old housewife. I met my husband, Jason, through a friend, and after about two years of dating, we got married. We've been together for about 30 years since then. My husband is a serious person but also has a playful side. Like a big kid, he laughs a lot, eats heartily, and knows when to be firm. That hasn't changed a bit over the years. As I was flipping through an album recently, I stumbled upon photos from when our son was born. Looking at the pictures of our baby boy, I recalled my husband's words. Let's name him John. He said while gazing at our peacefully sleeping newborn by my side on the day our son was born. I've been thinking about it for a while. Since I can't give birth to a child, I wanted to put a lot of effort into choosing his name. I admire that serious side of him. As I flipped through the pages of the album, I came across photos of me with my art class students. I quit my job to become a full-time housewife when I found out I was pregnant with John. However, I wasn't used to spending all my time at home. So, despite being pregnant, I started working part-time as an art instructor. Once a week, I taught art to a group of five to six students at the nearby community center. Painting had always been a hobby of mine, and I even dabbled in it as a painter. After giving birth, I began holding art classes in the spare room of our house, which was filled with oil paintings and sculptures. I remember when John got startled by one of the sculptures and started crying. I chuckled, reminiscing as I glanced through his growth milestones. His smile when he won the elementary school race, his tense face at the junior high entrance ceremony, the joyous expression when he put on his desired high school uniform after passing the entrance exam, the tear-streaked face of frustration after losing a match at the inter-high competition, and the proud look of departure when he left for college. And about five years ago, I also took photos at the wedding. Beaming with a smile like never before, he walked alongside Amy, his partner. Amy, with her chestnut hair adorned with a lovely tiara, also walked next to John, wearing a smile. My husband and I thought they were a perfect couple, and our relatives blessed them with admiration. It's said that Amy fell for John at first sight and made the first move, which sparked their relationship. When John introduced her to us, we learned that Amy was more of an athletic type. Amy used to play soccer too. John mentioned. Oh, really? That's surprising. I replied. Amy chuckled. I get that a lot. People are often surprised because I don't seem like I'd be into sports. So you like soccer? The conversation flowed endlessly, discussing favorite teams, positions played, and more. While I'm not well versed in soccer, my husband eagerly engaged in the conversation. Both John and I found ourselves listening on the sidelines, unable to keep up with their lively banter. Before long, a boy was born between them. In the album, there's a photo of my grandson Michael sleeping peacefully, all curled up. Both my husband and I were overjoyed at the arrival of our first grandchild. John and Amy discussed and bought a house, leaving the rented apartment behind. The first time my husband and I met Michael was when we visited their newly built home. Until then, we had only seen him through video calls, but seeing him in person made his cuteness even more apparent. My husband was absolutely smitten more than I had ever seen him before. He was clearly overjoyed. So cute. 
Michael. Grandpa loves you. He cooed, sticking out his tongue and making funny faces, to which Michael giggled in response. Um, Jason, do you like children? Amy asked, seeming slightly taken aback, a reaction I couldn't miss. Since Michael started attending kindergarten, Amy also began to return to work. The distance from John and Amy's house to ours is about an hour by car. The two working parents would often drop off Michael at our place on days when there was no kindergarten. Sorry for the inconvenience. Amy said apologetically, impeccably dressed in her suit and with her business makeup on. It's fine, my husband enjoys spending time with him, I reassured her. Michael. You're here again. What do you want to play today? My husband exclaimed. Come on out, Michael. Grandpa is ready to play. Amy urged him, seeming to sense his shyness. At first, Michael seemed a bit shy, hiding behind Amy. However, drawn in by my husband's playful nature, he gradually warmed up and began to play more freely. He wandered around the house, exploring every nook and cranny. While my husband briefly looked away, Michael wandered into the art classroom. It happened to be the day when students were starting to gather, one by one. Michael, what's wrong? I asked. Weird face. Michael pointed towards me. I was momentarily surprised, but he was referring to the still life sculpture I was holding. Oh, this thing. I chuckled. Surrounded by the gathering students, Michael became shy again and quickly left the room as if to escape. You have a cute grandson. As the students jokingly commented on my grandson's cuteness, we continued with the still life drawing for the day and eventually wrapped up the class. While tidying up the classroom, Michael returned once again. He looked embarrassed as he peeked from behind the door, glancing over at me. What's up? I asked, and hesitantly, he replied. I came to see the weird face. It seemed he was referring to the still life sculpture from earlier. I retrieved it from its original spot on the shelf and brought it down to Michael's eye level. He touched it curiously, marveling at it with an amazed. Wow. Then, he began sketching something with the sketchbook and marker he had brought along. It vaguely resembled the still life sculpture. Could it be? Michael, do you like drawing? I asked. Yeah. I like it. He murmured quietly, completely engrossed in his drawing. Since then, whenever I took care of Michael, I mostly brought him to this room. Of course, my husband felt lonely without us. He loved playing with Michael, but he wasn't particularly interested in drawing. It's great to have hobbies. Maybe he'll become a great artist in the future. My husband said, as he framed and displayed Michael's doodles scattered around the room. Michael kept drawing the still life sculpture until he got tired of it. There weren't many students as enthusiastic as him. Michael, why don't you try using this color here? I suggested, and Michael eagerly applied the crayon in that color. As the lively still life sculpture emerged, he was amazed and his eyes sparkled with excitement. We continued like this, but Amy wasn't pleased with it. Michael, did you dirty your hands with crayons again? They're even on your clothes. Whenever she came to pick him up, her angry outbursts were inevitable. Don't be so upset. Crayon stains wash out easily with water. I reassured her. How did you let it get to this point? Please pay more attention. Amy's anger wasn't solely because of this. As someone who loved soccer, she wanted Michael to play soccer too. That's why she didn't like me teaching him art. He's always drawing at home. It's because of you. Amy, that's not true. It's Michael's personality. No, it's because of you. That's why he can't get good at soccer. With frustration, Amy angrily took Michael's hand and left. Michael goes to the soccer club twice a week, accompanied by Amy. Recently, it seems he didn't perform well on the shooting practice test. She misunderstands that it's my fault Michael's soccer performance isn't improving. Everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. Amy has a talent for soccer, while Michael has a talent for drawing. These talents should be respected, but it seems Amy isn't being acknowledged. It's quite difficult. Amy will understand someday. 
Despite her husband's words, Amy's insistence on soccer for Michael only increased. One rainy day when Michael came home, he looked tired and sleepy. I asked what was wrong, as he's usually full of energy. I did workouts. So I'm tired. Workouts? Apparently, besides club practice, Amy told him to do extra workouts at home. But if I refuse, mom says it's not good. So you're doing it reluctantly. No wonder your performance isn't improving. Clearly disheartened, Michael nodded weakly. I decided to tell John about this. He was surprised and said, What? I heard from Amy that Michael practices on his own because he loves soccer. After that call, John started to watch Amy more carefully. Amy isn't scolding Michael to make him do workouts, but she seems to be pushing him towards self-practice with a stern tone. Hurry up! Do 20 sit-ups and 20 push-ups each. John witnessed Michael gritting his teeth to endure it. Amy, he's already doing it at the club, so why make him do it at home? Upon this remark, Amy raised her voice sharply. Consistency is crucial for this. But Michael looks really miserable. Of course workouts are tough. You, as an amateur, shouldn't butt in. John became timid in the face of Amy's aggression. Despite persistently advising afterward, he was eventually ignored. Continuing this, John finally sought my help. I feel like I'm banging my head against a brick wall. I said. Despite thinking so, I told Amy to stop forcing Michael to do workouts. Nancy, mind your own business. She said with a sharp tone, and from then on, she ignored anything I said. It seemed like she disliked me even more, and she never left Michael with me anymore. But then, when both of them had work and kindergarten was closed, Michael would be left alone at home. It's dangerous to leave a five-year-old alone at home. John seemed to have advised Amy about this. Hey, Amy. Maybe it's better to leave him with mom on days like this, don't you think? Leave him with Nancy? Are you kidding me? Amy adamantly refused. But John seemed uneasy. He wanted to hear my opinion too. It's indeed risky leaving Michael alone at home. When I said that, John seemed pleased as punch. You're right. Then, can we secretly leave Michael with mom? I don't mind, but... If they secretly left Michael with me, it would create secrets between John and Amy. Thinking about it, I didn't feel right. But meeting my grandson was a joy, and when we drew pictures together, I forgot all about it. One sunny Saturday, while I was drawing with Michael, Amy called. Michael, he's with you, right? What? I couldn't hide my surprise. How did she know? John has been acting strange lately, so I checked his phone. At first, she thought he might be cheating, but that wasn't the case. I found messages with Nancy. Something about leaving Michael or something. Leaving Michael alone is dangerous. I tried desperately to explain, but Amy wouldn't listen. I'll give John a piece of my mind when he gets back. Just stay out of our business. She hung up abruptly, leaving me frustrated. I never imagined we'd end up in such a situation with my daughter-in-law. How long will this situation last? It felt like wandering around searching for an invisible exit. Despite Amy continuing to be harsh with John, he still brought Michael home without hesitation. I get it now. Michael prefers drawing to soccer. A determination to protect what's important shone in his eyes. Seeing that, I felt a surge of courage in my heart too. I decided to focus on nurturing Michael's individuality. That's when I started to feel hopeful again. Several months had passed, and it was the time when many flowers were in bloom, marking my husband's birthday. On this day, as usual, I lined up my husband's favorite dishes on the table and invited the John family to celebrate. It feels a bit lonely just the two of us, doesn't it? It's better with more people after all. I remarked. When the Johns arrived on time, the party began. As we chatted about recent events and enjoyed the food, I noticed Michael's demeanor. He was fidgeting and hiding something behind him, like a piece of drawing paper. Michael, did you bring a present for Grandpa today? Amy said cheerfully, encouraging him. Come on, be brave. Go ahead and give it to him. She urged. However, 
Michael seemed embarrassed, fidgeting and looking down. So my husband gently approached him, as if offering a helping hand. Did you draw something? Would you like to show it to Grandpa? He asked softly. Michael then unfolded the rolled up paper and showed it to him. Grandpa! Happy birthday! Michael exclaimed. My husband accepted it with. Thank you. And slowly and lovingly unfolded it. A present from his beloved Michael would surely be special to my husband. Just as I was curious about what was drawn, and leaned in to take a peek, my husband, upon seeing the picture, crumpled it up instantly. Then, trembling, he crumpled it up even more and tossed it aside. Hey, what's going on? I quickly picked it up and unfolded the crumpled picture. It appeared to be a portrait of my husband. What are you doing? Apologize. I lashed out in anger, despite his likely sincere efforts in drawing it. Even Michael must have drawn it with my husband in mind, so why? Unfazed, my husband just stared at me. He has a habit of staring silently when he's quietly angry. Don't you notice? He said as he grabbed the hem of Michael's clothes and swiftly lifted it right there. Whoa. Michael was startled, nearly falling backward, but managed to hold himself. Underneath the lifted clothing were several small blue bruises. Huh. What's this? I looked at my husband. He gestured towards the paper with his chin, urging me to look. On the paper was a portrait of my husband. However, upon closer inspection, the mole's position and the shape of the nose were subtly different. There were also blue spots like marks on the lower part of the body below the portrait. Moreover, in the corner of the paper, the words, help me, were drawn small. I had a terrible feeling. Could those blue marks represent bruises on Michael's body? Was someone being harmed by being forced to draw portraits? As this thought crossed my mind, I looked at my husband, who nodded deeply. It seemed he was thinking the same thing. Someone was harming our grandson. Feeling the danger to our beloved grandson, my husband crumpled the picture in anger. Why on earth? As my husband trembled with anger, John, puzzled, approached. Mom, Dad, what's going on? When John came and saw Michael, he was shocked by his pitiful appearance. Michael, what happened to those bruises? I must have looked pale. With a sinking feeling, I showed John the drawing Michael had made. John was also surprised. This isn't Dad. And he raised his voice. What's the meaning of this? Tell the truth. Michael was startled and burst into tears. Seeing this, Amy rushed over, holding Michael protectively. Stop it. These bruises are from soccer practice. Mom, you're lying. For the first time, Michael rejected Amy and pulled away from her grasp. Mom and the teacher, they bullied me. John, my husband, and I were all confused. The portrait? I don't even know that person. Mom made me do it. With each word, Michael cried harder. Amy looked flustered. Um, well. And she started to speak. Meanwhile, Michael confessed everything. Amy instructed to draw a portrait of, Grandpa, for the birthday party. However, the person in the photo she showed Michael was an unfamiliar man. Despite refusing to draw it, she was told to draw the portrait of that person. Michael was convinced it was the new grandpa and was ordered to present it to my husband at today's birthday party. After hearing everything, the gaze of me, my husband, and John all turned to Amy, demanding an explanation. As she realized that everyone there was on Michael's side, she sighed in resignation. I found someone to be Michael's new father. I wanted Michael to see him as his dad. Him? So, you were cheating? We were already planning to be together. She spoke matter-of-factly, with a wicked smirk on her face. Amy said she deeply resented the fact that my husband and I were meeting Michael. She thought we were taking him away from her. You two spoil Michael. I thought it would hurt if he rejected you. She intended to brainwash Michael into thinking her new boyfriend was his father. And she wanted to see us hurt by Michael's rejection, laughing at our pain. If Michael rejected us on his own, she could blame it on him. 
and she planned to use that as an excuse to file for divorce. However, Michael didn't accept Amy's boyfriend as much as Amy had hoped. This came as a surprise to Amy herself. So, this plan is a failure. Michael is really no good. Amy glared at Michael, then stormed out. Only John followed her. Amy, wait. What's going on? Getting together with your boyfriend. But a few minutes later, John returned with drooped shoulders. Amy jumped into a passing taxi and drove off. Later, a message arrived on John's smartphone, saying, Heading back home. With just that message, he turned back. Well then, let's contact her parents over there and have them keep an eye on Amy. The husband suggested, to which John nodded silently in agreement. A few days later, it was unusually warm for this time of year, a day that could be called an Indian summer day when we invited Amy over to discuss matters. The four of us, my husband John, Amy, and I, gathered in the living room. Take a look at this. John said, tossing an envelope containing documents onto the table. John had hired a detective agency to investigate Amy. Since Michael started attending the soccer club, Amy's appearance had gradually changed. At first, he didn't pay much attention. However, he became suspicious when she started going to the beauty salon frequently and changing her makeup. What was even more conclusive was when he accidentally stumbled upon her exchanges on her smartphone. Furthermore, the person she was corresponding with was not a friend or acquaintance. He was a completely unknown man. I was shaken by the messages, want to meet again, like you, all with heart emojis. John said, with a detached tone. Looking at the results of the investigation, the person turned out to be a male coach from the soccer club. Amy didn't seem inclined to hide it quietly staring at the documents. I was planning to tell you after dad's birthday party. John spoke calmly, but like my husband, he was quietly angry. I regret not bringing it up sooner. Amy said nothing. After she ran off, we took Michael to the hospital to have his bruises examined. He had blue and red bruises, and he said they hurt. Upon hearing this, the doctor wondered. There's a possibility that he was being hit regularly in his daily life. Was he being hit every time he went to the club twice a week? Or was Amy hitting him while he practiced at home? Michael remained silent, his lips sealed. Amy, were you silencing him? I would never do such a thing. Bullying Michael while having an affair elsewhere, I misjudged you. I just needed some time for myself. That's why. Don't give me that nonsense. John reprimanded her, and he handed her a green paper. Divorce. Write this and leave. Fine, whatever. Without hesitation, Amy wrote her name. At that moment, the sound of a car pulling up outside could be heard. Amy looked puzzled, but when I ushered them inside, her expression froze. Why? Why are mom and dad here? Arrangements have been made for you to be handed over to your parents. Before Amy could say anything, she was dragged out by her parents. All that remained was the sound of the car driving away. The next day, John submitted the divorce papers to the city hall, and they were accepted without issue. Then, with the help of an acquaintance who recommended a lawyer, he pursued compensation from Amy and her affair partner. After paying the compensation, Amy found it difficult to continue working at her company due to the affair being exposed internally, so she resigned. Her affair partner faced more consequences than just paying compensation. The fact that he was having an affair with a club member's mother became known, and he was fired from the soccer club. As it was a relatively large club locally, rumors spread among the club members and related parents. The former coach became unemployed and continued to rely on Amy even after being with her. She supports him while working hard, even as a supermarket employee. Occasionally, we receive messages from her asking. Please let me meet Michael. But both John and I have decided not to respond. She's been issued a restraining order against Michael. It's unlikely to be lifted for the next six months. John sold the house he bought and moved in with Michael. Michael now lives with me and my husband. Grandma. Grandpa. Look. Oh my. Is that Grandpa? Let me see. 
Michael proudly showed us the finished painting. It depicted a large smiling face of my husband. The mole's position and the shape of the nose were identical to his. You've done a great job. Let's frame it. As my husband eagerly got up from his seat, Michael grinned happily. He looked incredibly pleased. Michael's bruises improved rapidly once he came my home. The doctor even took an x-ray to check for any fractures, but fortunately, there wasn't even a single crack, which was a huge relief. Michael quit the soccer club and is now happily spending his time at kindergarten and at home. At home, I watch over Michael's growth while teaching him his favorite art. Even though the physical wounds on his young body have healed, there may still be some scars in his heart. That thought suddenly crossed my mind, and I became worried. Next, I'll draw Grandma. As he said that, he filled a piece of paper with my face. His carefree use of colors and gestures revealed his childlike creativity. As I watched him, I couldn't help but smile, realizing that my worries seemed to be unfounded after all. Who could it be at this late hour? My husband and I checked the video intercom when the doorbell rang. There was our five-year-old granddaughter Nancy standing there, shivering. Grandma, help me. I quickly opened the door and let Nancy in. Come in, you must be cold. Where are your mom and dad? Nancy's body felt warm. Clearly, she had a fever. Surely. You didn't come here alone? Her response filled us with shock and anger. My name is Pamela, a 62-year-old housewife. Occasionally, I help my husband with his work. My husband, Ron, is the owner of a real estate company. It's locally based and not very large in scale, but thankfully, its performance is good, and we live comfortably. However, there is one concern on our minds. My daughter Molly and my granddaughter Nancy, who will turn five this year, are the one we have. Molly has always had a strong-willed personality since she was young, but as she entered her rebellious teenage years, her defiance only grew stronger. Her circle of friends also became gradually more flashy and mischievous. Despite our efforts to communicate with her, Molly's rebellious attitude has been resistant to change. My husband and I have patiently watched over her, believing that one day we would understand each other better, but that day has yet to come. After graduating from high school, my daughter moved out to live on her own while attending vocational school, and she rarely visited us. Several years passed, and she got married and gave birth to a daughter. Once she became a mother, she started to visit us with her child more frequently, and we thought that perhaps the day of understanding had finally arrived. However, over the past six months, our relationship with our daughter has begun to drift apart again. She doesn't reply to emails, and calls go to voicemail, leaving us unable to see our daughter and granddaughter. We assumed she must be busy. One day, I heard a concerning story from a close friend of mine. They mentioned seeing Nancy playing alone on the swings in the park, even though it was already dark outside in the late afternoon. Considering that it's not typical for a small child to play alone at that time and that there were no apparent adults around, it raised serious concerns. After hearing this, I couldn't shake off my worries, so I immediately called my daughter, but it went to voicemail as usual. Unable to sit still with worry, I decided to visit my daughter's home impulsively. My daughter, her husband Andy, and my granddaughter live in an apartment about a 15-minute drive from my home. She had been a stay-at-home mom ever since she became pregnant with my granddaughter, so I figured she'd be home on a weekday morning. However, there was no response when I pressed the intercom. When I rang it again, I got a response in an irritated tone, yes. As soon as she realized it was me, my daughter responded with a flustered tone. Huh. 
Mom. If you were coming, you should have called first. I called several times. You didn't reply to messages, and I couldn't reach you, so I came over. Can we talk for a bit? The house is really messy right now, so I'd rather you didn't come in. Besides, Nancy isn't feeling well and she's resting. It seemed my daughter really didn't want me to come up. Let's talk in the small park in front of the apartment building. Just for about 10 minutes. Reluctantly, my daughter agreed, and we ended up sitting on a bench in the small park in front of the apartment building to talk. Just showing up without any notice, what's the deal? It's incredibly rude. My daughter started speaking with an irritated tone. I've tried to contact you multiple times. I called you many times. How have you been lately? I haven't seen you in a while, so I was worried. Also, there's something bothering me that I want to ask you about. I told her the story I heard from a friend about seeing a child look like my granddaughter alone at the park. That person must have been mistaken. I wouldn't let her wander around alone at such a late hour. Don't worry, we all are doing fine. Is that so? Well, if you say so. In the end, I couldn't get much information that day and had to return home without seeing my granddaughter. A week later, I heard something concerning from my husband. Apparently, during a real estate industry gathering he attended, he bumped into a friend of 20 years who has been running a construction company. During their conversation about their respective companies, it came up that there's an employee at the friend's company whose work attitude seems to be lacking. Apparently, this employee is always talking about slot machines instead of focusing on work. If it were just casual hobby talk, I might overlook it, but it seems he's also borrowing money from colleagues. And you know what? The more I heard about it, the more it sounded like it might be Andy. The name and description match up too well to be him. Andy is my daughter's husband. He and my daughter were high school classmates, and they've been dating since then, belonging to a rambunctious group of friends. After graduating high school, Andy worked various jobs before joining his current company. I couldn't bring myself to say, that guy might be our son-in-law. Yeah, you're right. Hey, I think I'll visit Molly again. I've been worried about Nancy's condition since the other day, and it's been a while since I've seen her. My husband seemed equally concerned about how our daughter's family was doing and if our granddaughter was well. We decided to visit our daughter's house again the following Saturday to check on things. And on Friday night. Since we were planning to head to our daughter's house early the next morning, my husband and I went to bed a little earlier. After falling asleep for a while, we were awakened by the sound of the doorbell. Who could it be at this hour? My husband and I checked the video intercom, feeling cautious. Nancy. To our surprise, there was our granddaughter Nancy standing there shivering. Grandma, please help me. I quickly opened the door and welcomed Nancy inside. Come in, it must be cold outside. Where are your mom and dad? Nancy's body felt unusually hot in my arms. When I touched her forehead, it was clear she had a fever. What are you doing here at this hour? Did you come alone? I carried Nancy back to the living room. She was breathing heavily, perhaps due to the high fever. Most shocking of all was that she appeared much thinner than when we last saw her six months ago. I quickly fetched a blanket. In the living room, my husband was giving Nancy some hot milk. After laying her down on the sofa and wrapping her in a thick blanket, Nancy seemed to calm down a bit. I asked Nancy, 
What are you doing out here at this hour? How did you come here all alone? Mommy and Daddy went shopping. Mommy told Nancy to stay in bed because I caught a cold. After that, my granddaughter slowly opened up and shared her story. Despite the darkness outside, her parents didn't return, leaving her feeling lonely and hungry without any food. Feeling overwhelmingly vulnerable, she decided to walk to her grandparents' house, despite the late hour. She walked alone for what would have taken adults at least an hour, all while feeling unwell from her cold and overwhelmed by her emotions. Hearing her story, my heart felt heavy. We decided to take Nancy to the emergency hospital that night. The doctor diagnosed her with a high fever due to a cold and slight malnutrition, and she needed to receive intravenous fluids. As I watched my granddaughter sleep while receiving the four, tears welled up in my eyes. At the same time, I couldn't contain my anger towards my daughter and her husband for treating her like this. My husband seemed to share the same feeling. I stayed by my granddaughter's side the whole time, but after a while, my husband returned with our daughter and her husband. They were drinking with their gambling buddies at a nearby pub. After dropping off my granddaughter and me at the hospital, he went around the nearby pubs to look for them. Finally, on the fifth try at a pub, he found our daughter and son-in-law drinking with their friends. Apparently, even their friends were shocked to learn that they had left their young daughter alone. In a move to assist my husband, they forcibly brought our daughter and son-in-law to the hospital. They must have been scolded quite severely by my husband in the car. Both of them looked quite awkward. Do you two realize what you've done? Be honest and tell us everything you've done so far. Unable to bear it, I questioned them sternly, and they began to confess everything they had done. Every weekend, they would go to the slots and leave Nancy alone until late at night. And when they were lucky enough to win, they would gather their friends and go out drinking until the early hours, just like today. Surprisingly, they basically neglected Nancy, sometimes even serving her ready-made meals or, at worst, not providing her with any food at all. I couldn't hold my anger any longer. I will report you to the police. You're aware that what you're doing is wrong, right? That's why you stopped visiting us and refused to let me visit you. If things continue like this, you'll just keep repeating the same mistakes. What are you talking about? Involving the police is too extreme. Don't you love your own daughter? We also have a responsibility for raising you like this. Because you're our daughter, we will make sure you reflect on your actions properly. We'll take care of that. You've done something unforgivable. Do you understand? Afterward, since there was no resolution with the daughter and her husband, my husband decided to report them to the police. Some time later, they were sentenced to imprisonment. Our granddaughter Nancy came to live with us as we took her in. When she recovered, she asked us where her parents had gone. We couldn't hide it from her, so we decided to tell her the truth. You see, Mommy and Daddy did something very wrong to Nancy. They have to say sorry in another place for a while. So, until Mommy and Daddy come back, let's live together at Grandma and Grandpa's house, okay? Nancy listened quietly with her head down. Perhaps she understood in her own way, as she began to cry quietly, and I hugged her. It's okay, we'll be fine. Let's live happily together with Grandma and Grandpa from now on. I promise, Nancy, we won't let you feel sad. After that, my husband and I were busy every day with our second round of parenting. I prepared nutritious meals every day, considering her preferences, while my husband took her out to play whenever he had time off. 
Nancy's complexion improved day by day, and she started to look plumper like a girl her age. Most importantly, it was wonderful to see her smiling more often. Several years passed, and my daughter was released from prison. A few days after her release, she came to visit us. When I opened the front door, she bowed deeply to us. I'm truly sorry for everything. I've reflected on the unforgivable things I've done. I'm deeply sorry once again. She seemed genuinely remorseful as she apologized to us. After inviting her in and listening to her story, she told us that she had divorced Andy, her husband. Her time in prison had changed her drastically, and she appeared much calmer and more subdued than before. Is Nancy here? I want to live with her again so I've come to pick her up. Calling out her granddaughter's name, my daughter looked around the living room. Mom? Before I knew it, my granddaughter had come out of her room. Nancy, you've grown so much, and you're so tall now. Whether it was from happiness to see her mother or from nervousness, Nancy's face seemed a bit shy. Yeah. Mommy's here to take you home. However, when my daughter reached out her hand, Nancy instinctively stepped back. No. I want to stay with Grandma and Grandpa. Mommy will make lots of your favorite food, Nancy. When I was little and hungry, Mommy didn't cook for me. Grandma cooks a lot for me. And on days off, Grandpa plays with me a lot. I don't want to feel hungry and lonely like before. As she spoke, Nancy shed tears. Nancy, let's go back to your room. My husband took crying Nancy back to her room. Wait, I won't make you feel that way anymore. In the end, my daughter couldn't go home with Nancy that day. It was inevitable, but seeing my daughter leaving in tears was very painful. Afterwards, my daughter rented a small apartment and started living on her own. She works in a warehouse, which is physically demanding and quite challenging. It's still early days, but my husband and I have decided not to give up on her and watch over her. She always hands over child support every month without fail. Seeing her like this, it seems she has truly turned over a new leaf. And whenever she meets me, she always asks about Nancy. I told my daughter this. Even though Nancy was young, she hasn't forgotten what happened to her. When Nancy grows up more, maybe the day will come when she can forgive you. Until then, all you can do is keep your distance and watch over her. My daughter nodded tearfully at my words. Nancy is growing up healthy and thriving. It seems she has made many friends at school and she tells us about her day at the dinner table every day. Hearing such stories brings me immense happiness. Though I feel bad for my daughter, I can't help but wish for days like these to continue. But I hope that someday Nancy will be able to forgive her mother, and when that day comes, I wish for my daughter and granddaughter to live together as a family again.